the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. Of course, the major topic was the future of Eastern Europe and above all Poland. Eastern Europe, important though it was, was only one of many other things. First of all, occupying Germany. Secondly, seeing to the war against Japan. Thirdly, the post-war arrangements. President Truman decided that he would tell Stalin that we had a powerful new weapon without identifying it as a nuclear weapon. As we now know, they knew all about the Manhattan Project through uh, espionage and their own agents. The bomb was finally released exactly at the designated hour, and the explosion occurred as planned. Analysis of the V-2 immediately after the end of the war clearly suggested that a rocket-powered, long-range weapon might be a useful addition to a military arsenal. It didn't take long for military planners to note the possibility of long-range rockets armed with nuclear warheads. I think what surprised us was that considering the devastation which had taken place in the Soviet Union as a result of World War II, we didn't think they would be able to amass the necessary infrastructure to develop the bomb, but they certainly did. And they, they clearly uh, were in our knicker, so to speak. More and more we learned how well they had infiltrated the whole of Manhattan Project. A great global schism developed during these years. This political discord was based on two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, competing for the respect of the world in general and the unaligned nations in particular. Cold War was a state of high political tension and intense military rivalry. The United States and its Western allies versus the Soviet Union and its socialist satellite states. To defend themselves, the superpowers depended on the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. To deter either side from initiating a nuclear attack, both sides were committed to a full-scale nuclear counterattack, assuring the total destruction of both nations. Aerospace manufacturers responded to military requirements with rocket-powered ballistic missiles of ever-increasing range and accuracy. Thousands of ballistic missiles armed with nuclear warheads created by the two superpowers and pointed toward each other. Scientists, particularly Russian and American, recognized that if it would be possible to use one of these new high-performance military rockets carrying scientific instruments to put a man-made object into orbit around the Earth, it would have a new perspective that allow accurate measurements, perhaps solving or at least shedding new light on some of Earth's mysteries. Both countries publicly announced that they were trying to develop an artificial satellite. Three, two, one, they didn't recognize it at the time, but they had started a new competition, which eventually became known as the Space Race. Запустили спутник, потому что мы сами не знали, что мы сделали. А весь мир целые газеты посвящал запуску спутника. Так только на следующий день и наша газета посвятила спутнику большое дело. А сейчас Sputnik shocked the American public. We believe we're the most technologically advanced community in the world. And President Eisenhower tried to calm the waters. I consider our country's satellite program to be well-designed 
and properly scheduled to achieve the scientific purposes for which it was initiated. He said his concern about our nation's security had not diminished one iota. Actually, he was probably very worried. A rocket that had the power and the accuracy to orbit a satellite had the power and accuracy to send a nuclear warhead across the ocean to a specific target. All of a sudden, I mean, our confidence was just totally shaken down to the ground. You know, the Russians were our big enemy, so uh, people were scared, but the, a lot of the kids in the United States at that time, we were excited. I mean, not that the Russians had done it, but that anybody had done it. Because we always imagined that maybe a hundred years, a century away, or a thousand, maybe something would get into space. I mean, not, not even thinking about people in space, but just anything. Uh, nobody even knew if it was possible. And so we started to kind of really identify with this. And I read in the paper where Sputnik was going to fly over Coldwell. And I thought, I really want to see that. And so I told my mom, I'm going to go out tonight, mom, and watch Sputnik fly over. And she told Mrs. Sherritt next door, who told Mrs. McLaughlin next door, who told Mrs. Todd. And um, that night, about half the town, it seemed like, was in my backyard. But the Soviets continued to dominate the space race, winning heat after heat. In addition to the first satellite, they rocketed the first animal into orbit, the, the Russian dog Laika. The Soviets were the first to fly a probe around the moon and the first to send a remote controlled craft to reach the surface. The progress was astounding and too many Americans were racing. Good morning, gentlemen. Be seated, please. I have a very important announcement for you. We've been assigned the mission of launching a scientific Earth satellite. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. Let's go, Werner. Well, those were rather hectic 84 days, I can assure you of that. A project like uh, firing a satellite into orbit is only possible if there's splendid teamwork all the way through. I don't know many of us knew what, of anything. What we knew was specialized. Some people may know trajectory, some may know a little propulsion, but nobody knew it all together. Von Braun, when you talk to him, you realize you're talking all facets of the subject because he knew trajectory and the guidance, he knew propulsion, he knew everything there was. And he knew all amazed at how friendly he was. And that, of course, was the first big step in this country when uh, the Von Braun team uh, developed and built the Redstone vehicle. Uh, that had uh, much improved target accuracy. It was basically otherwise still a grown up V2. Hello, Len. You can send this off to the secretary. That our satellite is definitely on orbit. I'm convinced that the Russian concept, as, as demonstrated by Sputnik number two carrying this animal, they uh, consider the control of space around the Earth very much like, uh, shall we say, the great maritime powers considered the control of the seas in the 16th to the 18th century. And uh, they say, if we want to control this planet, we have to control the space around it. We cannot and will not ever get into this race as we should, so long as all of our objectives are short-term objectives. We need a 10 to 12 year program that has as its ultimate goal the man domination of space. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. Public interest in these space activities was unbelievably high. Congress and the executive branch agreed that the United States should have an agency specifically dedicated to the exploration and exploitation of space. And so it happened that President Eisenhower signed the law creating NASA. They were thinking about, and the rumor had come around, about sending someone up into space in a tin can or in a capsule on a big booster. As a matter of fact, they were very serious. I know now that they're looking at what kind of an individual do they want. But it was President Eisenhower that suggested to NASA to get military test pilots. Uh, they're used to testing new vehicles, and also they had security clearances and uh, some of the stuff was still classified. So NASA sent out a notice to both the Air Force and the Navy. 
saying, please give us a list of the people who have the following criteria. Well, the Air Force and the Navy came up with 110 candidates. I was a naval officer on the carrier Hornet. I got orders signed by CNO. The order said, report to Washington at such and such a time, do not discuss. But um, I went in to a briefing at the Pentagon and that's how I heard about the NASA project. We got up there, got the briefing. They're gonna use an Atlas ICBM. They were gonna put this uh, Mercury capsule, put them up in, in orbit. Well, when I was growing up, uh, there was no such thing as astronaut. The word hadn't been invented yet, as far as I know. Uh, space flight was something that was just Buck Rogers type novel writing, but nobody ever, ever thought that it would seriously take place, and lo and behold, it took place in our time. It ended up that 32 people went for the second phase, the Loveless Clinic in Albuquerque, New Mexico, for this week-long examination. We reported in and they ran the most complete physicals you ever saw in your life. NASA was really going overboard on just trying to cover everything that they could measure in all these tests to see how you responded, not knowing exactly what was going to happen. We rode at four G's, four times gravity, in the 25-foot arm centrifuge. At a shake test on a vibration chair where you shook again. Uh, the heat chamber, you had a uh, rectal thermometer in that, that was remotely they could read it outside. I think we're in the heat chamber at 135 degrees. Of course, there were whole batteries of uh, psychological tests we went through. When I made the finals, uh, one of seven, NASA folks said, well now, you'd better call your parents and let them know what you've been doing because you, your name's going to be in the paper tomorrow. Well, of course, that was one of the happiest days of my life. That was the day in which we all congregated officially as the uh, U.S. first astronaut group. These ladies and gentlemen are the nation's Mercury astronauts. Which of these men will be first to orbit the Earth, I cannot tell you. He won't know himself until the day of the flight. I'm John Glenn. I'm the lonesome Marine on this outfit, and I'm uh, 37. Uh, in answer to this same question a few days ago from someone else, uh, I jokingly, uh, of course, said that uh, I got on this project because it'd probably be the nearest to heaven I'd ever get, and I wanted to make the most of it. But uh, my feelings are that this whole project with regard to, to space sort of stands with us now as, as, if you want to look at it one way, like the Wright brothers stood at Kitty Hawk about 50 years ago. I think it's typical of most of us in this country we're interested in new things. Aviation has been a new thing. Uh, now it's a 50-year-old thing. As far as my motivation is concerned, I feel that this is the future of not only this country, but the world. Uh, we've gone about as far as we can on this globe, and we have to start looking around a bit. Uh, my career has been uh, serving the nation, serving the country. And uh, here's another opportunity where they need my talents. And I'm most grateful for an opportunity to uh, serve in this capacity. I wondered, first of all, where these six incompetent guys came from. <laughs> it was not a surprise because several of them had been involved in the preliminary selection process. So I was generally familiar with their background. Glenn, of course, I had known before. Shira, I had known before because of our Navy connections. So I knew there was a lot of talent there. I knew that uh, it was going to be a tough fight to win the prize.